Good morning, everybody. Hey, this is Kelly Carr at New Hope Community Church, but also through Higher Purpose Ministries. And today I'm going to, to do a message that we did Sunday, but uh, we weren't able to record it. So I want to go back and go ahead and do that again. Today our message is about fresh starts from a faithful Savior. Fresh starts from a faithful Savior. You know, everybody wants a fresh start in life, and sometimes we, <laughs> we really need a fresh start in life. You may have heard the story about the lady that went out in the ocean. She was out in the ocean swimming, and, and suddenly, I mean, she started going down, and she's waving her arms for help, and a man sees her on, on the side of, on, from the beach, and he, he runs, he dives into the ocean waves, you know, and he swims out to where she is, and and he, just as she's about to go under, he reaches out and grabs her by the hand, but it's not her hand. She was wearing a glove, if you can believe that she was wearing a glove. And he pulled the glove off and realized, oh, I don't, I don't have her yet. So he s s turned around, swam back to her, and grabbed her this time by the hair, thinking that's the way you're supposed to do it. And he grabbed her by the hair, but she was wearing a wig, and the wig came off in his hand. And so he turned around and realized, oh, I don't have her yet. And so he swam to her again. And, and this time, you know, she was about to go under again. She had completely turned over. He grabbed her by the leg and, and started to, to, to pull her back in, but realized, oh, no, she had an artificial leg, and it fell off. And, and so in the midst of all that, he turned around and waved back to the shore and said, Somebody help me. We have to save as much of this woman as we possibly can. And so maybe you've ever felt that way. I tell you what, if you're a pastor, you felt that way sometimes. Hey, we've got to save as, as many of these people as we possibly can. And, you know, this lady, think about, you know, needing a fresh start. Boy, she sure did. She had a rough day. Well, we're talking about fresh starts today from a faithful Savior. And our passage will be in Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, and we'll begin in verse 27 in just a moment. You know, I found that everybody needs a fresh start sometimes. And in fact, maybe if you've been called to do something great, but you're not really having as much of an effect as you thought you wanted to, you need a fresh start too. And I believe God's called all of us to make a difference in this life. And every Christian can make a difference. God's called you to do that. And he has equipped you to do that. And we're going to see how the Savior himself did that in the message today. And I hope it will be a blessing to you and, and it will encourage you. I believe every church needs to be a, a, an agent of change and every Christian needs to be an agent of change. And together we can make a great difference in the lives of people. And um, you think about all the great ministries that are out there today. And they're out there be, making a great difference because people have committed to do that. They have, they have committed themselves to make a difference. And so we're going to talk about how ministries and people can make that difference and how we can all have a fresh start when we need one. I believe Jesus is our example. He set the bar for us. And in this story, we're going to see how Jesus did. We're going to look at a life in the day, or rather a day in the life of Jesus, and see what it was like. You know, in, in, in Mark chapter 10, 45... Uh, Jesus said that he came to give his life as a ransom for many. And, uh, you know, when we look at that verse, I mean, really, uh, he came to save, seeking to save the lost, but he also came to give his life as a ransom to many. Jesus came to save and to give. And if we're going to follow him and his example, then we need to be that way as well. And so uh, he is our example. Now, first of all, I want us to read in Matthew chapter 9, verse 27 through 34. If you have your Bible, you can follow along with me. He says, As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. And when he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Notice how they called him Lord then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, will it be done to you? And their sight was restored. And Jesus warned them sternly, See to it that no one knows about this. 
But they went out and spread the great news about him all over that region. And while they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. And the crowd was amazed and said, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, It is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. Isn't it interesting how there's always critics? I mean, Jesus had critics. And let me just tell you something, Christian. If you're out there and you're ministering and you're reaching out to people, you're going to have some critics too. Just get used to it. Just get ready for it. But I I love this. I see how Jesus ministered to these two men that were blind and one man that was mute. He couldn't speak. And so he, he healed both of them or both classes of them, all three of these people at that moment. And, and notice how these blind men came to him. The first thing I want you to see about Jesus and his ministry, because it applies to our ministry today, is that Jesus had a healing ministry. Listen, friend, if, you, if you're in a place in your life where you are just down and out and depressed and you think it's over and you think there's nothing that can do and there's no solution to your problem, let me tell you something. Jesus had and has a healing ministry. He had it then. He's got it now. He healed people then. He heals people now. He healed these two blind men and he healed this man who was demon possessed. Well, here it's interesting. Let's, let's, let's look at this a little bit more. He had this healing ministry. It was a redemptive and a restorative ministry in a very tough world, a, a world that tends to just chew people up and spit them out. They don't call it the daily grind for nothing. It has a tendency to crush the spirit. Did you know in the, in, in the Gospels we read of 35 separate miracles that Jesus personally performed. Now we know that there were many more than that. In fact, John tells us in his gospel that it would be impossible to write about all of the things that he did because he did so many things. But 35 of them are recorded and uh, they're real miracles. And and in this passage, we have two quick cameos of the miracles that Jesus did in Matthew 9, uh, Chapter, 20, uh, chapter 9, verse 27 to 34, just a couple of them, a couple of portraits, if you might say, of, of uh, Jesus' ministry, but also they are portraits of the spiritual condition of Israel in Jesus' day, and they are portraits of spiritual condition of people in our day right now. And the first miracle, I want you to notice that Jesus healed the blind. He healed the blind. There were two blind men. Uh, blind men. Now, Israel was spiritually blind. They, they couldn't see that Jesus was the Messiah. The, their, Israel's, the, their leaders refused to acknowledge Jesus as the Savior and as the Messiah. They didn't recognize Him. And these blind men, though physically blind, they had spiritual insight. How do I know that? Because when they appealed to Jesus, they called Him Son of of David. I want you to just to point out something about their condition, you know. Uh, they were physically blind, but I want you to know something. Today, there are a lot of people that are spiritually blind, just like the leaders of their nation were spiritually blind in that day, because Satan steals people's sight. He does. He blinds people's eyes. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4 says, The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. He's blinded their minds. Satan's job is to cause spiritual blindness. And he's good at it too, isn't he? And it may be here that you're here listening to me today because um, and, and you don't believe in Jesus or there's been a reason for you not to believe in Jesus, but now the circumstances of your life have begun to turn around in such a way that, that you're starting to, to say, well, maybe what I learned before wasn't all right. And Maybe I do need to turn around and put my faith in Jesus. Maybe Jesus is real. Well, consider that possibility with me. Somebody said there there are none so blind as those who will not see. Many today, you know, think that their problem, if they ask them what their real problem is, they say, well, my real problem is finances. 
I just don't make enough money. Or my real problem is my job. Or, or my real problem is my boss. Oh, if you met my boss. And the boss says, my real problem are my employees. And, and the parents say, my real problem are the kids. And the kids say, my real problem are the parents. Some people would say, well, my real problem is stress. It's just stressing me out. This pandemic has stressed me out. Some people say it's the economy. But you know what? They really just need God. It's amazing how many other problems will st begin to get straightened out once we have this relationship between us and God gets right. So many other things begin to get right too. And, and these men, they really needed God. They were, um, uh, they were aware of their spiritual need unlike the others in that nation who were blind to their true and deep need. These two men were physically blind, and they had never even seen or witnessed a miracle. And yet they put their faith in Jesus. They proclaimed their faith in Jesus whenever they called out to him, Son of David. That was a messianic term. They were appealing to him as the Messiah of the land, the Savior. Just what the Old Testament had said. They called him the son of David. But then also, whenever he said, do you believe that I am able to do this? They said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. They expressed their faith in him by the way that they addressed him. You know, the spiritually blind need help, just like the physically blind do. I mean, how do you think those, those men, those blind men found Jesus? Well, some, they had to ask somebody. Somebody had to help them and point them and lead them in the way. You know, the Bible tells us the same thing. As believers, we are to reach out to those who are spiritually blind, who don't recognize the, the deep need that they truly have, and help them find Jesus. You know, I'm excited very much about Back to Church Sunday, which will be September the 19th this year. It's a national, it's a national event every year. We have something called National Back to Church Sunday, and we invite people. All of our members will invite someone to come. We're trying to invite people, especially those who don't know the Lord. Sometimes we're inviting church members that maybe have wandered away or strayed away. Sometimes we're inviting Christians. Maybe they have moved into our area. They're not members of our church, but we want them to come in. Maybe for some reason they're backslidden and they need to come back to the Lord. Or it may just be that there are people in the community that don't know the Lord at all, but you know what? They need to, and they don't know how much they need Jesus, and they don't know how much they need the church either. And so uh, that's something I'm really looking forward to, National Back to Church Sunday at September the 19th. But I think about that song, Amazing Grace. We sing it here. It's kind of a Baptist national anthem. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, 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 but now I see. <laughs> you know, that, old, that was written by an old sea captain, a captain of a slave ship. His name was John Newton in the 1600s who and 1700s, who actually be, became a Christian. He came to Christ. And it changed his life forever. The first half of his life, he lived for himself. After that, he began to live for Jesus and began to try and do something about the evils of the slave trade that he had helped actually to, uh, to keep going. It's a fact. You know, it's interesting, I, I think this, that Jesus told those two men to keep quiet. He healed them, and they could see, and they were excited, just like you can imagine. And he said, now you keep this quiet. But they told everybody, and he tells us as believers, as Christians, tell everybody the good news. And we tell nobody. We tell nobody. But that was one miracle. He healed those two blind men at once, not just one, but two. And the second miracle we see in this, in this passage is in verses 32 to 34. It's a man that came to Jesus, and he was mute. He couldn't speak. I, w I guess everybody thought, well, he just can't speak for some reason. We don't know why he can't speak. But Jesus knew why he couldn't speak, and he dealt with the root problem the man had. And by the way, he, he freed this person who was bound by demons. He was bound by demons and Jesus freed him because Jesus heals the blind 
and he frees the bound. He liberates those who are bound. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, the Bible tells us. In fact, in Ephesians 6, we're told to put on the full armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy. See, the problem here was disguised. Satan is a master of disguise. It seemed physical, but it was really spiritual. And it's an object lesson to that crowd that day. You see, they, they thought it was just a, a physical problem, but then they, they learned very quickly that it wasn't just a physical problem, but also it was a very spiritual problem the day. You know that crowd that day? It says they admired Jesus, but they did not believe in him. And that's what God's calling every one of us to do, is to believe in him, not just to admire Jesus, but to believe in him. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Listen to the criticism in verse 34. It says, The Pharisees said it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. Hey, listen, friend, you need to expect criticism. If you're a Christian and you're out witnessing to people and you're out trying to win people to Christ and you're trying to help grow your church and grow your Sunday school class and grow your ministry and, and do the things that are needed there, expect some criticism. You know, Jesus had enemies, and he said, if I have them, you'll have them too. And boy, was he ever right. Now, listen to what those Pharisees said. It's by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. Why did they say that? Because they couldn't deny that he had just driven out this demon. And that this man who previously could not speak was now speaking and praising Jesus. They could not deny that miracle. They could not deny that those two men who were blind, could now see. And so they recognized that it took supernatural power for that to happen. And so they, rather than just believe in Jesus, they said, oh, well, it's by the, it's by the devil. The devil gave him the power to do it. Listen, it wasn't the devil. It was his father, Jesus. It was Jesus' father, God, who allowed him to do it. And here's what i found as I look around and people, I've talked to people, so many people through the years, that people are, are literally, many of them are bound. They want to come to Jesus, but they're bound. They're bound up by things and they need to be liberated. People today are prisoners of peer pressure. You don't believe it? we got kids going back to school right now. Some of them starting today, starting this week. They're going back to school, and I want you to know they're going to be under so much peer pressure to be, just conform. And if you don't believe it, what about social media? While on social media you are pressured to conform to whatever is going on, whatever they say is uh, correct or not correct, boy, don't put out any misinformation, and that means something that disagrees with them. <laughs> so... You know, people are, are, are prisoners of peer pressure and they're slaves to sex today. There, there's so many that are enslaved by, by bad habits and, and bad ideas about sex and they're gripped by greed and, and they've been defeated by drugs and abused by alcohol and they've been mastered by materialism that we live in today. Those are the devil's tools and he disguises himself and these are his disguises. And Jesus set that man free. He set him free. <laughs> you know what? Because the Bible, Jesus said that himself. He says, the truth will set you free. And he is the truth. The truth will set you free. He had a healing ministry and a liberating ministry to people that were blinded in sin and bound by Satan. And by the way, that's our ministry today, to reach out to those who are blind, to reach out to those who are bound and need help. And it makes a real difference in the lives of people. Where else can you go? But to Jesus, where else can you go for real, real healing today? <laughs> Warning. A healing ministry can be a messy ministry. I mean, it really can. When you reach out and you start reaching out to people that are hurt, that are dying, that are lost, that have problems, that have sin in their lives... Listen, it gets messy. It gets messy, but it's worthwhile. <laughs> you know, uh, I remember uh, not a couple of years back, I, I went to uh, a mission uh, to Costa Rica. While we were there, 
we were invited to go in and speak at a, a clinic. It was, in fact, it was an AIDS clinic, and it was a home where they lived, people that had contracted that, the AIDS virus and uh, HIV. And they, many of them, they were sick, and you know, they knew they were going to die. We preached the gospel. I remember preaching that day, and very simple message with an interpreter. And ten people trusted in Christ. Ten people. Ten souls. Now that we're on the way to hell, that are now on their way to heaven. Jesus freed them and healed them. We have a healing ministry. Now, secondly, Jesus had a heavenly message. Listen to verse 35. The Bible says here that Jesus went through all the towns and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Notice what it says here. I, I want you to know this, that Jesus' emphasis was not on the miracles. I mean, we talk about the miracles, but his emphasis was not just on the miracles. His emphasis was on the preaching and the teaching and the message. He had a heavenly message. Um, he was more than just a miracle worker. He was a mighty preacher. I mean, think of the preachers that, that they compared Jesus to. He said, who do people say that I am? And his disciples said, well, some say you're like Elijah. Elijah? Wow, what a, what a preacher. Some say you're like Jeremiah. Jeremiah? What a preacher. Two guys that, I mean, really had an impact on their nation. And, and they preached in tough times against tough leaders with crowds that didn't believe. And yet, Jesus had the same type of message. He had a, a healing message. It was a message of hope. It was a message of redemption. And, but his emphasis wasn't on the miracles, but on the, the message. And, uh, you know, here's something. Think about what kind of a preacher was he was. Listen, nobody's going to be listening to my sermons 2,000 years from now, but we're still listening to the sermons Jesus preached 2,000 years later. Why? Because there's life in his message. It's the gospel. It's the good news that gives life. Now, what did he do? He said, well, he taught the word. He taught the word. He says he went into the villages teaching in their synagogues. What did he teach? Well, not opinions, not theories, not pop psychology. He opened the scriptures and taught to them from the word of God. He told them from the word of God who he was. What you believe really is important. If you want long-term change in your life, you better believe in some truth that will bring long-term change change. We must believe in the word of truth and don't be ashamed of it. We need to teach doctrine. We need to teach the virgin birth and the deity of Christ. We, we need to teach the inerrancy of the word of God. We need to teach that uh, Jesus truly is coming again someday. We need to teach these things that the, the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead on the third day, just like the Bible says. That's doctrine. We need to teach those things. I'm so glad that this New Hope Community Church is a Bible-teaching, Bible-believing church. We teach the Bible in our Sunday school classes and in our worship services, and uh, what, a, what a good reputation for a church to have. Now, Jesus taught the Word, and He preached, it says, the gospel. He preached the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. And boy, he could preach. And that's why we preach. And that's why we must preach. There's no substitute for preaching. <laughs> you know, the world's scared of preaching. You know it. That's why in many countries today, it's illegal. Why? Because they're scared of it. They know if people begin to hear the truth, they'll be changed. Why do you think the framers of our uh, Constitution and the founders of our country provided for freedom of religion and free speech because they knew that this was a safeguard of the truth and a safeguard uh, for, for the country because we're preaching the word of truth. <laughs> the Bible says, repent. And Jesus' message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why? Because the king was there presenting himself. Accepting the kingdom and accepting the king. Jesus asked people to believe on him. <laughs> Not a doctrine, not pop psychology, not a list. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, just flip over a couple of chapters, and you get to Matthew chapter 11. He says, Come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus 
is the way. He calls us to come to Him. Jesus didn't ask people to come to a doctrine, a list, a denomination, or an agenda, but a person, Jesus. And that's our message today. We have a message of hope for this world. Jesus changes lives. Jesus gives salvation. Jesus, and only Jesus, can provide a home in heaven. It's a message based on good news. We have a Savior who loves us. Well, we minister in a world that's lost, that's dying, that's hurting. We minister to those who are spiritually blind and those who are bound by sin and, and Satan, a world that's often hostile to the very message that it needs to be saved. And it's often hostile at the very messengers that bring that message and deliver it. But we really need to remember Jesus' motivation. What was Jesus' heart? Why did he do it? Well, if you've been following Jesus very long, you know. You know. It's not easy to keep going sometimes. And you know that there are times when you feel like giving up. What made Jesus leave those golden streets of heaven to come down to the, uh, the blood-drenched road of Calvary? What enabled Jesus to face rejection and keep going? What held him on the cross? It wasn't the nails. but It was his genuine compassion for the lost. You see, he had a healing ministry. He had a heavenly message because he had a heartfelt motivation, a heartfelt motivation, a motivation that's real, that comes from inside. In, in verse 36 of chapter 9, he says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and, and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. They, they weren't fed. They, 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 they were uncared for, unprotected, hungry, thirsty, lost, sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, look, the harvest is plentiful. He looked at those people, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And then he said this, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. Oh, wow, what a great passage of Scripture. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into this great harvest field, into his harvest field. You see, here's... What I notice about what Jesus said, number one, he had compassion for the lost. That, that Greek word there for compassion literally refers to a person's bowels. You know, when we feel something in our heart, it, it affects us physically. <laughs> you ever get nervous and you have that, that sick feeling in your stomach? Or maybe you had butterflies? Or maybe you get really tense and your neck he, you know, tenses up, you know, in your back and soon it's all your muscles. Hey, why? Because our emotions affect how, how we, our body works and how our body feels. Well, Jesus had this, it says from inside, deep inside of him, he began to feel emotion for them. What's your emotion for those around you who don't know Christ? Do you even know? Do you even care? Do you even have a list of people that you know that you're praying for? I hope so. Jesus did. Ask, ask. Here's a good prayer for you, Christian. Ask Jesus to help you see people through His eyes, to help you see people the way He did, to know how He felt about people. You know, I mean, He was. He looked at that crowd and He felt compassion for them. In fact, it says He was overwhelmed by the need. I mean, He looked out there at that crowd. And there's, it was vast. He says the, the harvest is plentiful. There's more work here than we can do. It's humanly impossible. And he said, uh, you know, the harvest is plentiful. There are many people to be one. You know, we live in a town that, that in Princeton, this is growing so fast, so very fast. They can't build schools fast enough to keep up. They can't build businesses fast enough to keep up with all the people that are moving in here, all the houses that they're building and, and apartments and everything else, it's overwhelming. And, and the pastors, and I work with a lot of pastors here, and, you know, it's an overwhelming feeling. But you don't argue over it. You don't fight over it because it's kind of like two ants arguing over who's going to eat the elephant. I mean, there's plenty here. The crowd was out there. The, the, the harvest field is, is plentiful. But the workers, where are they? The workers are few. The harvest means work and lots of it. I grew up in cotton country in West Texas. You know, and, and, and during harvest time, it was round the clock work. 
Because when the harvest came, you had to get it out of the field while you could, while there was time, while the weather permitted. See, you can cultivate and plant and irrigate and fertilize and weed and still lose a harvest. It can rot in the field because you can't get to it. And so when it's harvest time, get in the field. Right now, while it's daytime, while you have health. You say, but I have a job right now. I don't have time. Well, you have time. I don't have time to go to church. You know, I'm too busy to go to church. I always found that was kind of interesting because it, you think that everybody else at church doesn't have a job. Everybody else at church isn't busy. Listen, we're all busy, but you got to make time. You got to plan it. You got to schedule it. And you've got to look at your schedule and your kid's schedule and, and, and get that done. Just do what Nike says. Just do it. <laughs> look for outreach opportunities too. Look around you at the outreach opportunities. The harvest is plentiful. Then he says the laborers are few. There's lots of work, but few workers. Christian, is God calling you into the harvest field today? Is he saying you need to attach yourself to a local church and work together with a group of believers to bring in the harvest in these last days, you need to do it. It makes tremendous, it takes, listen, friend, it takes tremendously unselfish maturity to reach the lost. Tremendous unselfish maturity to grow a ministry, to reach people, to disciple people. It's not easy. And he gave his disciples this prayer request down in verse 38. He said, Ask the Lord of the harvest. Who's that? The Father to send out laborers into his harvest field. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send more laborers, send more servant leaders, send eagles. I pray that God will send eagles to our church. I mean, I, I pray that he'll send the lost, but I pray he'll send a few people along the way that are already equipped, that are already trained, that already know how to lead somebody to Christ, that already have a heart for ministry, that he'll lead them here too so we can work together and work shoulder to shoulder, I mean, send some eagles, some soul winners, some winsome people. And Lord, I just pray, give your people a heart of compassion right here. What a great thought for a church. Adult reaching out to adults, senior adults reaching out to senior adults, couples reaching to couples, singles to singles, youth to youth. I mean, maybe God's calling somebody listening to me today into full-time ministry. Pastors, youth pastors, worship leaders, seminary professors, missionaries, evangelists. Is the Lord of the harvest calling you today? Say yes. Say, say the same thing Isaiah said. Here am I, Lord, send me. Is the Lord of harvest calling you? Think about it. People that make a difference and change lives. Ministries that, that make a real difference. And people that need a fresh start. You know, because we have a... a, a a healing ministry for those who are blind and can't see their need and can't see Jesus and those who are bound and by Satan. We have this heavenly message. It's the gospel. We have a heartfelt motivation. I mean, it's compassion that if we look at people the way Jesus does, we have that in our lives today. We have it right now. But we also have to be willing to pay the price. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 38, Jesus said, Anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He calls you and me to take up our cross and follow him. Now the cross is not something, you, it wasn't a lapel pin. <laughs> it wasn't a little necklace on a chain. He was talking about a real cross that said, you know, my future doesn't belong to me anymore. You need to take up your cross that cross that says you are despised by the world, but you are accepted by Jesus. <laughs> You're accepted by the Father. You take up your cross and follow me. Follow him and do what? Well, what he did. You see, he had a healing ministry, a saving ministry. He had a heavenly message. He taught the word. He preached the gospel. And... He had a heartfelt motivation. He really loved people. He still loves people. You know, I go around all over Princeton and McKinney and other places, and I hand out little cards like this, just like this. It's a simple thing to do. This is a little American flag, and 
It's kind of a 3D thing, kind of waves. You can see it waving. It looks like a flag waving in the wind. And when I hand it to people, and I've got a few others similar to it. On the back it says, in God we trust, with a question mark. God's promised to bless those who trust in Him. What are you trusting today? And it just has a little gospel message there very quickly, very easily. Yeah, it's just a way of getting the message out. And there are so many things that you can do to get the message out. And God's called us to do it. Uh, he empowered them to be change agents. He called them to do it. And He calls us to do it too. Listen, friend. You need a fresh start today? Maybe you've been blinded by Satan, but suddenly you've just heard something. The Holy Spirit has touched you in here. And you, you don't know what that feeling is, but you, you know that something's happened in here. And the Holy Spirit has touched you and said, He's right. What He's saying is the truth. You need to listen to that and be saved. Then be freed. Be free. Be saved. Cast off your blindness. Cast off your chains. You know, Jesus literally went to the cross to die for our sins. It cost him everything to be your Savior. He loves you that much. He does. Hey, believer, let me ask you a question. Are you going to do what Jesus did? Are you going to do what he's called us to do? Are you willing to see people through his eyes? His eyes of compassion. I'm going to ask you to, to pray. I'm going to ask you to do something specific. You know, we have a little list here called our Back to Church Sunday prayer list. And whatever you do, wherever you're listening to me, even in the back of your Bible or on uh, a back of a sheet of paper, maybe a note on your phone, just write down the names of some people that you're praying for. As the Lord puts somebody on your heart who needs to be saved, just Type their number in on your phone or write, write it on a sheet of paper. Write in the back of your Bible. Start a prayer list. And what's going to happen is you're going to begin to see in the days ahead, one by one, as God saves those people. He answers your prayers. And you know what? He might even let you be the person who shares the good news with them. Need a fresh start today spiritually? Are you backslidden away from God and you need a fresh start? We invite you to come. God loves you. He gives out fresh starts every day. Why don't you take one today from Him? Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, thank You for Your love for us. I pray if anybody is listening today who's never before accepted You as Savior, that today, right now, in this moment, they will come to know that love that You have for us. Lord, that You died on the cross for our sin that you were buried on the third day, you rose again from the dead. And Lord, that everyone who will believe in you and put their faith in you, their sins can be forgiven. And they'll become a child of God. They'll have a home in heaven one day. And they'll have your help every step of the way throughout the rest of this life. And Lord, I pray that you will save somebody right now. And if you're listening to me and you've never before been saved, listen, the Bible says whoever will call on the name of the Lord, will be saved. Be saved today. Call on Him. Pray a prayer something like this. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've blown it. I know I'm lost. But I believe that You love me. I believe Jesus died for me on that cross. I believe He rose from the dead for me. And right now, I ask You to come into my life. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Save me. I'm putting my trust in you and you alone right now. Give me a home in heaven one day. I'm trusting in you. If that's your prayer, the Bible says this, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. God loves you very much. He loves you very much. And so do we.